so I've been asked to speak on what to choose, generic medications or branded medications. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what generic and branded medications are, why are there differences in costs, how does quality compare, how does efficacy compare, and finally, how I make a decision whether to use one product or the other. So we are all familiar with the term branded. So what do you mean by branded? So branded in medicine basically means that this is a drug which has been created, invented by a company or licensed by somebody, by the company, to make it. So that's a company which has actually invented the drug. A branded generic is one which has a brand name and which is essentially a duplicate of the original medication. And this is possible either because the first medication went off patent or because the patent laws in that country allowed the medication to happen. And the third thing is a generic. And a generic is basically when the medication is sold as its generic name. For example, ranitidine hydrochloride, sold as ranitidine hydrochloride without a brand name attached to it. And this is, in India, is a very, very small group of medicines which are actually marketed in the Jan Oshadi shops. They are made by public sector units and they are marketed at a very low price. In ophthalmology, we have no generic medications. We have only branded and branded generic and that's what I will talk about today. When you look at the drug approval procedure for a branded medication, it starts off with you know, lab tests, then you go on to doing, uh, you go on to doing uh, sort of preclinical experiments in animals, and then you go to phase one, phase two, phase three testing. And if your product is good enough, one of the two or three thousand which pass through all this, then you go to market. For a generic medication, the route is much easier. You have to show that the drug is similar in composition and toxicity. And for a systemic medication, you have to show bioequivalence, which essentially means that you give a pill and you take blood samples at various times and show that the blood levels in the body are similar to what they are for the innovator molecule. And that's enough. You don't need to do anything more than that. What are the costs involved for each of these? This data is about 15 years old, but it's estimated that for a new product, a new drug in uh, ophthalmology or in uh, systemic diseases, it costs about 800 million US dollars to create one new product. For a generic, if you exclude the cost of reverse engineering the drug, the filing costs are under a million dollars. So the difference between the two is about 1,500 times. And that's the reason why generic medications are cheaper than branded medications. But how do you get bioequivalent studies for eye drops? You cannot put an eye drop and then take aqueous samples every few minutes to see whether you are actually reaching good concentrations or not. So for eye drops in the eye, you have to show that the, the formulation is the same in the sense of concentration of the drug is the same or within 5% of the uh, accepted concentration range. And till recently, you did not even have to show that the preservatives were in the same range. Now the US insists that the preservatives and other additives should be within 5% of the innovator molecule. So basically, we have concerns about ophthalmic generics because of this reason, since we really don't have bioequivalence data. I'm coming to now systemic studies, uh, systemic generic medications compared in uh, branded versus generic, two studies from India. The first study is actually uh, an interesting design. What they did is they compared chemical composition, solubility, toxicity, and a couple of other parameters for to, uh, for five drugs, and these included anti-allergics, um, antibiotics, and other things, they had, these companies had a license to manufacture the branded drug. And all these companies also had their own branded generic of the same drug. So they compared these two, and they found that this, they were actually very similar. So in terms of quality, all these things, they were excellent. The second study actually looked at efficacy of antibiotics of a branded versus a generic. And again, they looked at circle of inhibition on culture plates and they found that they were similar. We have all taken all these medicines at some point in our life. And they're all effective. We have all used them. So systemic generic medications made by reasonably good companies don't seem to be a problem. But looking at the same study, when you look at costs, the price to the retailer for the generic is about 25 to 30% cheaper. The price to the consumer is 0 to 40% cheaper. But what was interesting to me was that the retailer margin is 200 to 1,000% higher for a generic. So if you're getting a generic from a good company, that's not an issue. But what about the really 
cheap generics. Do retailers have undue uh, incentive to push those drugs to our patients? And that happens. You go to a pharmacy, this is not available, we'll give you something else. And some of them are from companies that we've never even heard of. So this is something that we must keep in mind. I'll talk a little bit about the number of generics in ophthalmology available. So obviously, if you look at, this is all glaucoma. If you look at glaucoma, the maximum number of generics you have is for timolol, where it's more than 30. Other than that, most of the rest of the drugs, you have less than 10 generics available in the market. If you look at a cost ratio, there is a maximum cost in the market versus the minimum cost in the market, you have a ratio of 1 to 11 times. So there are some generics which are almost the same price as the branded, and you have one product where the ratio is 11 times. Any guesses? The next highest ratio is about 3, 3 and a half times. And the 11 time product, believe it or not, is acetazolamide tablets. This is a drug which is off patent forever. It's an oral medication. And the most expensive drug is 11 times more expensive than the cheapest. So our generic eye drops for glaucoma are actually fairly reasonably priced compared to what you look at in systemic medication. Coming to efficacy, and there are a couple of studies that I'll talk about. One is this, uh, which basically looked at generic versus brand name topical glaucoma drops. What they looked at was uh, a gel formulation, and they found that the formulation actually had significantly less amount of the active drug as compared to the uh, branded equivalent in the US. This is a study that we did some time back where we looked at Xalatan versus a generic latinoprost, and this was uh, basic, we had. Uh, it was a small study. We had two groups. One group was given Xalatan first, and the other group was given the generic first. We followed the patients up for about three months, and what we saw here was essentially this, uh, that you had about a 40% reduction in intraocular pressure with Xalatan versus about a 25% with the other drug. But what we did was we crossed it over. So the patients on Xalatan then went on to the generic, and the patients on the generic went on to the latinoprost. And there, when we did that, we found that the difference was not that exaggerated. The patients who were on the generics showed a little bit more of intraocular pressure reduction with the Xalatan. The patients on the Xalatan actually pressures went up marginally compared to the reduction with the generic. So the difference was there, but it wasn't that huge. So generic medications do work. They may not work as effectively as the original molecule, but they do work. And in this study, there were no real safety and efficacy concerns. This is from the US, and what they did is they looked at all the active ingredients and preservatives in a brand name product over here, again, Xalatan, versus two generic uh, molecules. So when you look at particle, particulate matter, you know, you see these things floating around. So these are all things which are commonly found in products in India, in, uh, globally. They looked at the number of these unidentified floating objects. Even with the branded product, you had almost 80,000 floating objects. With the other two, you had almost 100,000 floating objects. And over a period of a month, you can see what happened to these things. So with Xalatan, it went up 8%. With the other two, it went up 60, 30 to 60%. So why does it go up? Is it because this is leaching out of the bottle? Is it because your preservatives are not working? Or is it because some of the chemicals are just sort of uh, coalescing together? We don't know. But there are definite concerns in terms of the additives. They appear to be much more with the uh, generic product. They also looked at what happens to the concentration of the drug with time. This is the concentration at baseline. So Xalatan is about 100%, uh, 105%, 5% more than acceptable, which is OK. The others are 110 and 115%, significantly more. Then they looked at what happened to the concentration over a 25, over a 30-day period at 25 degrees Celsius or Bangalore weather. weather. So you found 95%, and the other two concentrations dropped to 80% at 30 days. If you look at a lot of the rest of India or Chennai weather, and they looked at 50 degrees Celsius over a month, see what happened to the concentrations. Xalatan still held out around 90%, but the other two drugs dropped to around 65-70%. The same study, then they looked at how long does it take for the concentration of the drug to drop from the, whatever they started with to 90%. At 25 degrees Celsius, 
50 days for Xalatan. We are comfortable. We don't want to ask the patient to use it for more than a month anyway. Generic 1, 12 days. Generic 2, 12 days. When the temperatures go up a little higher, 50 degrees, Xalatan just about makes it to 30 days, and the other two just about a week. So in India, temperatures are going to range between these two. So for the drug to reach 90% concentrations, probably in about 10 days after opening the vial, you would reach this concentration. And we have to keep that in mind as to what implications it has for our patient. This is the, a study from RP Center, which looked at something similar. There are many more generic lacnopros over here. And what you will see here, that if you look at this line, If you look at, sorry, yeah. If you look at this line, and you will see that there are three products here. This is generic two, generic four, and Xalatan, which are all fairly close to what the concentration should be. The other four products are either lower or significantly higher than what happens. So they looked at simulated use, 30 days the patients used. I mean, they used to kept the vial for 30 days and saw what happened. And now you'll see that it's again generic 2, generic 4, and Xalatan, which does pretty well. Concentrations are at around a 90% level. But you look at generic 5, concentrations are fairly good, but don't forget generic 5 started with almost 20% uh, higher concentrations than the other two. So some of the Indian generics seem to be reasonable compared to others. So how do I decide? which generic medication or branded medication to choose. And it depends on cost. So obviously, if a patient cannot afford a medication, there's no point in prescribing it. And there are a lot of our patients, unlike systemic disease, where you can buy medicines for a week or three days, there are patients who cannot afford to shell out 600 rupees up front to buy a branded product. But they can actually spend that money over a month. So if you cannot prescribe, if, you, if a patient cannot afford the drug, you are justified in prescribing a generic product because it does work and it's better that you give a patient a, a drug that he can afford rather than one that he cannot afford. But here I would strongly suggest that the way I would choose a generic is by one that is made by a reputable company. And there are a number of companies in India today which make FDA, uh, which have FDA approved uh, sort of uh, uh, factories and which have reasonably good uh, supply chains and things like that. So reputation of the drug is very, of the company is very important to me when I decide to choose which generic I'm going to choose. Because I want to make sure it's made in a decent place and not in a pressure cooker in somebody's kitchen. Which does happen in parts of this country. And the third thing that I would strongly emphasize is don't switch. And the reason for this is many of us who have patients who are covered by CGHS or other schemes, you prescribe a drug, the patient goes to the CGHS. First day, they get product X. Next time they go, they get product Y. And the third time they go, it'll be product Z. So if you have established that one product did actually reduce the intraocular pressure to your target level, the moment you switch, based on the data I showed you, you cannot be sure what the concentration of the drug is. You cannot be sure whether that concentration is going to be maintained over a month. And you're going to have a patient who's going to have this yo-yo intraocular pressure control. You don't know whether it's because the drugs are changing, or you don't know whether it's because he's not using the drug, or you don't know it's whether because he's actually having fluctuating disease. So keep in mind that you can use a generic, or you can use a branded, depending on the patient can afford. Use something that has, is made by a reasonably reputed company, and most importantly, don't switch. Thank you.